Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for iOS Today is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. Serenity Caldwell is here to talk about the new Apple Watch with cellular and her tips on taking video and photos with the new iPhone 8. Plus, at long last, Siri can Google herself. All that and so much more coming right up on iOS Today. This episode of iOS Today is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash iOS today. And by Texture. Access the world's most popular magazines anytime, anywhere using your smartphone or tablet. Try it free for 14 days at texture.com slash twit. And by Jamf Now, Apple management software for Mac, iPad, and iPhone devices. Visit jamf.com slash iOS today to create your free Jamf Now account and manage your first three devices for free. Welcome to iOS Today. This is the show where we talk about iPads and Apple Watches and iPhones and other stuff that we find interesting. I'm Megan Maroney. Leo Laporte is on vacation for one more week, but joining me today is the amazing Serenity Caldwell, Managing Editor at iMore. Welcome, Serenity. Thanks for having me, Megan. I am excited to talk about all of the things. <laughs> I am excited to talk about all of the things with you. Uh, it's been a big week. I got my iPhone 8, the glass back. I usually have a case, but I took it off so you can see the big difference and the big fingerprint on there. Uh, I'm pretty excited about it and the wireless charging. I'm more excited, however, as we all are, about the things I didn't get, including the Apple Watch with cellular. Now, you got a review unit and have posted your review. Um, and soon after the reviews started hitting, several people got re got uh, reviews units. And then Lauren Good at The Verge was the first to discover that the LTE didn't work so great. Uh, for her, <laughs> it was working fine for other people. And then you uncovered that this wasn't just a bug that happened in the new Apple Watch. Talk a little bit about why people were having trouble with the LTE in the Apple Watch. Absolutely. So um, what it comes down to is that the Apple Watch is essentially uh, pre-cellular was essentially a uh, like it, a jump device. So it didn't have any, you know, major antennas on itself. Instead, what it had was a way to connect to your phone over Bluetooth and share its data connection. And then it also had uh, a Wi-Fi antenna that allowed it to hop on Wi-Fi networks that your iPhone had already been to. Um, and this is a little bit different than say, you know, all of your other iOS devices or all your other Macs where you can hop on those. Right. Um, and, uh, but without necessarily entering a password, uh, but unfortunately on the Apple watch, uh, if you need to enter in subsequent information, for instance, if you go to a Google Starbucks and you know, when you, when you go to Starbucks and, and it shows the Google screen, it's like Wi-Fi presented, you know, free by Google press, press accept to connect. Uh, that works on an iPhone. That works on an iPad. There's there's no way to do it on an Apple Watch. Uh, so what was happening and what has been happening basically is that the Apple Watch would connect to Wi-Fi networks it thought the iPhone knew. So an example, uh, for example, the, the Google network at Starbucks, uh, but it couldn't get through that interstitial, you know, press accept to connect. And as a result of that, uh, it just sat on that Wi-Fi network and was like, I can't get a signal, but I'm connected. So to you, it just feels like the watch is flaky. And and quite honestly, I think that's why it went unnoticed for so long is that we've become kind of used to the fact that Siri sometimes is going to take a long time to respond or she's just not going to work at all when, when using the Apple Watch. Uh, and it was just kind of a like, yeah, well, the, it's trying to do some pretty, you know, crazy stuff. So we're going to be OK with it. Uh, and not actually realizing, oh, hey, this is a this isn't just like the occasional error on the, you know, the routing part. This is actually a problem with the Apple Watch uh, and more specifically the, the way the Apple Watch handles Wi-Fi networks. 
Uh, so when the LTE model came out, this was kind of put into sharp focus because the LTE model to save battery, because, you know, it's a very tiny watch uh, with an LTE antenna in the screen uh, as a result of, you know, LTE potentially being a battery hog, Apple's like, well, ideally your watch is going to prefer an iPhone connection. And if it can't find the iPhone connection, it's going to grab onto a known Wi-Fi network. And if it can't find a Wi-Fi network, then it will hit LTE. Uh, so it, what was happening is the watch would recognize that the iPhone wasn't there. So it was just like, okay, no iPhone. Next step, is there an LTE or is there a Wi-Fi network? And if there was a Wi-Fi network that your iPhone had connected to, it immediately grabbed onto that even if the Wi-Fi network was as what we were talking about in, in interstitial network, which led to people basically getting disconnected messages on their watch and not actually being able to connect to LTE, despite the fact that they were away from their uh, their iPhone. And it was, you know, understandably confusing to folks, including Lauren Good. Um, I know Joanna Stern had a couple of issues. Uh, so that's a, you know, that, that was a bit of a pain and Apple did come out and they were like, yep, okay, this is a, this is a bug. Uh, we're going to fix it as soon as possible. And we really don't have an alternative to what you can do in the meantime, uh, which is again, a little bit frustrating, uh, especially considering that, uh, yeah, Apple watches have been around. This is the third generation, technically the fourth, if you count series one and two as, you know, two distinct models, uh, and Apple didn't fix it in three years. So uh, they're a little behind the times on that, which is a little, again, a little frustrating, but hopefully it will be fixed soon. And uh, what I've been giving kind of as advice to folks is um, the easiest, or I guess not easiest, but the most direct way to make sure that this doesn't happen is to uh, basically clear out your iCloud Wi-Fi networks uh, for interstitial, interstitial, so like hotel networks and things like that. Uh, make sure that your your iPhone doesn't remember them. Um, but the easiest thing to do if you're having connection issues is I will tap airplane mode on and off on my watch. And oftentimes, if you do that when it's already connected to an interstitial, it'll reboot the the whole signal and it'll be like, oh, okay, never mind. I'm just going to grab LTE instead of instead of this Wi-Fi network. So the old turn it off and turn it back on trick. Pretty much. Pretty much. That is crazy. I mean, imagine how frustrating for someone. How much does the uh, the the Series Three with LTE cost? Is it four? That starts at three ninety nine for the thirty eight millimeter version. So you've just laid out four hundred dollars for a phone, and you, and and probably an an extra ten or tw sometimes even twenty dollars a month on your cell phone mm, for plan, your plan, and you want this feature, and then it doesn't work. Yeah, and I can understand people being very frustrated. And in addition, I should note that I don't think that all of the problems people were having are solely related to this LTE bug. I think a lot of it has to do with the environments that uh, the reviewers who did have problems were testing them in. Um, New York City, for example, is a is notorious for terrible cell phone signal, and it's gotten a lot better in recent years. But there are still, you know, the the hotel that I was staying at for when we when we did this Apple Watch review uh, outside the hotel, I had you know, three to four bars of, of service on my iPhone and my Apple Watch inside the hotel. I had two bars of service on my phone and no bars of service on my Apple Watch. Uh, so it's, I mean, I, I don't know if that's a case of the watch antenna just being a little bit weaker because it's smaller and thus, you know, not being able to quite connect so well. Uh, or if it's just, you know, it's a, it's a networking problem where if you're in a very congested area, uh, the Apple Watch is going to have some some regular trouble with that. And again, I go back to my previous tip, turning it off and on again sometimes changes the priority in the queue for for grabbing cell, you know, cell signal, but uh ultimately that's a that that is a problem that we've been having with cellular devices for years and I unfortunately don't see it going away with a cellular Apple Watch. Well, in one sense, you say like, oh, how, how frustrating it is to, to me to be skating through New York City with my AirPods and my Apple Watch, my tiny computer in my hand, and it doesn't, I can't make a phone call. Um, but at the yeah. same time, like that, and so yes, uh, you know, that's not ideal. But at the same time, you pay- Hashtag for first world problems. <laughs> exactly. Yes. But at, at the same time, that's what they were promising. That's what you were paying for. So uh, hopefully they will fix it soon. 
Yes, I, I have high hopes for the Wi-Fi bug to be fixed because it really hopefully is a simple fix. Just don't let the Apple Watch connect to interstitials or better, add some kind of interface for the Apple Watch to connect to new Wi-Fi networks so that it can kind of manage that stuff a little bit more autonomously. Um, but the cellular thing is going to be a little bit trickier. Just, I mean, that may just be Apple talking to cellular providers and being like, you need more power here. It's New York City. Have you thought about putting up another cellular tower? But that's regulatory and all that jazz. So a little, little bit different. And you were actually able, were you able to make a FaceTime audio international call to Renee Ritchie on your yes. Apple Watch? That's pretty <laughs> yes, amazing. <I> <laughs> It is pretty amazing, honestly. And granted, he was only about a mile away, but oh. it was still pretty, you know, he was, but he was still, it was calling an international phone, right? Right. So that's the, that's the thing that I was noticing running into, and this is a carrier by carrier limitation, but uh, on AT&T, for example, I wasn't able to send SMS texts when I was away from my phone and my phone was in airplane mode. Um, it might be that if my phone was not in airplane mode, it was just, you know, it was on, but somewhere else it would have still been able to route through the network. But I think with the phone completely disabled, there are some carrier limitations, including for AT&T, it was me not being able to send SMSs and also me not being able to make a traditional international call on cellular. Uh, however, there's a route around that. And that, of course, is Apple's iMessage and FaceTime audio servers which are available period because the watch is an independent device and can talk to Apple servers and just say, hey, I am Apple Watch, you know, custom encryption code here. I would like to talk to device custom encryption code here with this message. Please connect the two. Uh, and in that case, the, the watch does it quite admirably. I was really amazed. You could send iMessages, make FaceTime audio calls with or without the watch or with, with, with or without the phone, with the phone in airplane mode, with the phone off, with the phone, you know, two miles away. Uh, it was really, really quite impressive. A little, little bit of battery life cost. <laughs> and so you said that you use the watch explorer face, the, the explorer face. Does that show the, your cell phone, uh, whether you have cell phone coverage where you are on the, on the watch? Yes, it does. It's really cool. It, um, it, it looks very similar to one of the other faces, kind of the utility face. I don't know if you can see if we can turn this on here. Mm. I don't know if that'll actually work. Mm. This is the problem with trying to show off an Apple watch. <laughs> it's like so that's the Explorer face. Uh, and then right in between, right underneath the 12, uh, on the, on the face, when you're connected to cellular, it will start flashing between four dashes and four dots, very Morse code. Uh, and uh, when you connect to cellular, that switches from those little dashes to a certain number of green dots. And that will show you how much cellular signal you have in a given place. And if you don't have cellular signal or if you're connected to your iPhone, it'll show something different. So if you're connected to your iPhone, nothing will show at all. And if you're connected, if you're not connected, period, it's just going to show a big X at the top of the watch face right above the 12. So you kind of, it's it's a really nice, like quick glance of what's going on on your Apple watch. And it's actually, I'm frustrated that this doesn't exist as a complication for other watch faces because while well, the, this comp, this, this watch face is not too bad. I personally prefer the modular face or the astronomy face or one of my photo faces, uh, and to, you know, to not have that as a quick glance of like, oh, this is my cellular service. This is how it goes. Or if I'm on act watch activity, for example, and I want to see how my rings are doing while I'm in a workout, but I can't tell whether I'm connected to cellular or not. So I can, I don't know, make a FaceTime audio call to Renee and brag about how hard I'm working. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a, that, that's a little bit, I, I hope that's something that they will add in future updates. Okay, so now that we've gotten the bug out of the way, what uh, let's talk about your review in general of the good yep. things about uh, the watch. How long were you able to test? Oh, you still have it, right? Yeah, I yeah. still have it. I have, this is a Series 3 GPS plus cellular. You can see the, the red dot. What is that? What's that red dot all about? Is that just to show that you could possibly make a phone call and to warn people? It's about fashion, that? honestly. Oh. I, I mean, uh, we've had a couple of theories of why there's a dot. Um, and I think the two most likely candidates are a, that it's a fashion choice and Johnny Ive loves his signature watches. I think it's, uh, Michelle watches that, that have customarily had a red crown. Um, I think a, a commenter on YouTube mentioned that and I have, I haven't yet to 
ex- to explore into that, but it's an interesting side note. And then the other is the possibility of if you work in an environment, for instance, um, like a government facility that disallows cell phones but allows fitness devices, it might be a regulatory thing where you have to show that this thing is in some way connected to cellular. But those are the the main two theories, I think, of, of what's going on there. Mm. I have a friend that works in the State Department um, and they're not allowed to wear any, they're not allowed to wear Apple watches, they're not allowed to wear Fitbits or anything. Red dot or no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're just like, nope, sorry, no technology. Yeah, you which could, I think is a good steal thing. our data. No, it makes sense. <laughs> I, I, I would prefer that uh, our data, you know, in the government, be as safe as possible mm-hmm. <laughs> for I, many reasons. <laughs> I think we should start calling it the red badge of courage. The red badge of courage. Yeah, mm-hmm. true courage. <laughs> putting a dot on a watch. <laughs> okay, so now we get out taking away the headphones. We've joke. got the fashion <laughs> point of it. Um, how, how is the battery life? and explain a little bit about what you did with it that that, uh, affected the battery life. Absolutely. So um, I would say that the battery life is slightly better than the Series 2, not dramatically so, but a 38 millimeter watch owners aren't going to have a huge thing to complain about when they're using the watch the way that they might normally do throughout the day, which is uh, while during my testing, and I've noted before, I have the GPS plus cellular model and the GPS only model on my wrist because I wanted to see if there was any kind of battery differential between the two of them. Uh, And it turns out, honestly, not so much um, as long as you're using it, you know, not intensively with the cellular antenna. So for instance, this week I took my watches to my 8 a.m. roller derby practice and I wore both of them Uh, and started a skating workout. uh, And they were, you know, both at 100 when I started the day. And then when I finished the skating workout, I think they were both at like 89%. Um, Then I went on a walk with, uh, to kind of simulate the the feel of cellular. I went on a walk with this thing and left my iPhone behind for this. So I got the cellular antenna activated here. And then on this watch, I just left the phone that it was paired to behind period. So I got the disconnected, which can also drain battery a little bit faster for the non LTE models. So I did an outdoor walk of about 30 minutes and compared them. And after that, despite the fact that I did a couple Siri queries um, and I sent a couple text messages, they were still within a couple percentage points of each other. I think the uh, the Series 3 GPS was a couple of ticks higher. So like, you know, 78 to 74 or something along those lines. Um, and then I did another like a, a quick, you know, 10, 15 minute high intensity workout at the end. Uh, I used both watches in in the house connected to their component iPhones doing Siri. Um, and I used both as viewfinders for their respective camera apps because that, again, anything that's graphically intensive is going to run down these batteries quite a bit. And by the end of the day, uh, they still had about 25% uh, on both watches. Uh, this one, by the end of the day, was about, I think, seven percentage points lower than the other watch. So we're still, you know, uh, even using GPS and cellular signals, you know, now and again, you're still going to get quite good battery life. The problem comes when you decide that this watch is what you're going to attempt to just use throughout the day. And that's what I did in New York City. Uh, My first day with the watch, I really just hammered the heck out of this watch. Uh, where we, you know, I was running it. I, I called my parents uh, just with the LTE antenna. I called, you know, Renee with the phone connected. I made FaceTime audio calls with the phone disconnected. I sent text messages. I used it as a viewfinder. I took it skating and on a skating workout. You know, I just, I, I threw everything that I that I could think of at the watch. And by the end of the day, uh, by like 7 p.m., it was starting to give me like angry <laughs> 15% battery life. It's time to charge me, please. Um, and that that is so, uh, that's more like what I used to get from my Series Zero Apple Watch, um, which is, you know, it's not the best battery life in the world. Obviously, you would like <laughs> a watch to last you the entire day. Uh, But I think I can pretty confidently say, especially having now tested it for almost an additional week, um, that the kind of testing that I threw it into that first day is very out of the ordinary. Um, And with, as I said, with occasional LTE usage like you would throughout the day, I think people should have absolutely no problems making the battery last until from when you get up at, you know, seven or eight in the morning to when you go to bed. 
Yeah, you just brought back uh, memories of my Series Zero, too, because it would never make it through the day. And the 38 especially. Mm -hmm. Oh, that poor little watch. <laughs> And so that's why I upgraded to the 42, the big, uh, it, they're not men's or women's watches. Many men wear no. the smaller one, but that's why I upgraded to have the bigger battery life. And every, when I go to bed, it's 75%. I have no troubles with it at all, but you don't have there troubles you. with your 30, 38 too. I mean, you make a good point that Apple could have just said, especially with the cellular, like we only have the, you know, the 42 millimeter, sorry, uh, thin wrist people out there. Um, we're, we're going to try to make it. Uh, we care more about battery life than than fashion, but they don't. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's nope. pretty amazing. And you said earlier that the LTE uh, antenna is in the screen. It is. So this is this is the crazy technology that enabled them to be able to put an LTE antenna in a tiny watch. Is that this the antenna is actually built into the underside of the OLED display. So like this here is actually engineered to basically fit right into the screen and use the screen as a bounce so that you can get a stronger signal. It's uh, I am not an engineer, so I am going to leave my discussion or my description at that and encourage you to actually research what Apple has done because it's really fantastic. But those are the kinds of uh, those are the kinds of feats and engineering um, you know, exploits that the other companies are just not thinking about. You know, Apple could have easily wedged an LTE antenna into the 42 millimeter watch casing and not really had to do much extra with it. But because they had to engineer for the 38 as well, they really had to think innovatively about how they were going to manufacture this watch. Um, and because they had that smaller size, they were able to, you know, create something entirely new for LTE signal on a small device, which in turn probably not only, you know, made it an, an easier, you know, a, a better connection than what would have been trying to like put it in aluminum and maybe having watch, you know, like the little bands that we get uh, when on previous versions of iPhones. Uh, they were able to build it into the glass and probably improved 42 millimeter battery life in the in, as a result. It's uh, it's probably a more efficient design than just taking a stock off the off the shelf part and wedging it into a tiny case. So, are you going to get one? Yes, um, I actually already I already got one, uh, but I am going to return it for the Nike Plus uh, Red Band Sport Loop oh. because that that band looks awfully nice in person, uh, and it is uh, at currently one of the few red bands that you can buy from Apple. Period. So, uh, so I think I'm just going to lean that direction. But I will say. Uh, this is my review unit. I really do love this gold coloring on the uh, the new sort of shade of gold, and it matches the iPhone 8 and 8 Plus shade of gold. I didn't like the Series 2 Apple Watch because I felt it was a little bit too purple. It just didn't it didn't look great on my wrist. Uh, it kind of looked like I was wearing like a tiny Oompa Loompa, a square Oompa Loompa on my wrist. Uh, and this one, I just, I really like the fact that it's kind of like this muted differential shade between gold and rose gold. And it goes well with almost everything, which is really, really nice. So uh, so that's the only thing kind of holding me back from from returning my gold watch and, and getting a getting that space gray black one with the red band, but I, I really like the red band. <laughs> well, just get all the bands like Renee does. Yeah, all the bands. <laughs> you can't buy that one. You have to buy the watch to get the band. Oh yeah, that's a bummer. Okay, so you, so is that the one that we're, are we looking at that one too? Can you see? Yeah, yeah. isn't that a pretty, that's, it's, it's such a pretty red. And it's Velcro? It is. So these are, these, I think this is my favorite innovation that uh, Apple has made for the Series 3. Uh, that's a lie. LTE is pretty cool. But this guy, <laughs> I'll, I'll rip it into the mic so you can really hear the Velcro. Velcro uh, is pretty this, cool. It is, but it's not even, so it's not technically Velcro because Velcro is a brand. It is hook and loop closures because <laughs> Apple decided that Velcro wasn't good enough. The company was going to make their own form of Velcro. Uh, so these are actually, the entire band is, uh, are loops, basically what you would connect Velcro to. Uh, and it's, I, I don't even know if my camera will catch, oh, will yeah. focus on this if I pull it in tight enough. Oh, yeah. um, but it's really impressive. My uh, my coworker, Micah Sargent, did a really lovely macro look on iMore of the sport loop as well, where you he really just went in close and took some pictures of how this thing works. Um, but it's essentially a big a big band of, of loop 
And what I really love is see how it has this connector, this plastic connector at the end. If you try and resize this in the middle of a run, say, you know, you're, you put on your watch and then your wrist kind of either shrinks or slip, you know, the watch starts slipping because you're sweating. Uh, you can take this off and readjust it mid-workout. And because it has this catch, uh, it's not going to fall off your wrist and you're not going to throw your Apple Watch into the dirt or off of your bike or, you know, <laughs> in my case, underneath a bunch of roller skates. <laughs> so instead, you can just kind of like pull it on and... And you're awesome. just like, whoop. Yeah. I imagine so there's just some little, old, there's some little old lady somewhere just sewing those each hook. <laughs> little, little tiny loops. But yeah, we really should take a look at, at Micah's story because okay. those pictures are beautiful. That, is that his band? That is his. Uh-huh. That's his Midnight Blue mm, sport I, band. I like that. And you notice the the Velcro, it's not all just one straight strip. It's these little tiny circular strips, mm. which uh, I'm assuming Apple did to create sort of a better connection and closure. Uh, sometimes, you know, when you try and Velcro something, it doesn't quite fit correctly or you get it, you know, you, you, you get the edges and they start rubbing against your skin and that's never really fun. So having these like little circular or I guess slightly oval Velcro uh, hooks, it, it, I don't know, it makes for a really, it feels really nice and tight. The fact that this band isn't fabric at all, that it's nylon, which it doesn't feel like. It feels like terry cloth, basically. Uh, and it, I like, I have worn this band in roller derby practices. I have worn this band. I wore this band yesterday, you know, working out. Uh, and it does not get wet and gross the way that the woven nylon band could when you're, you know, taking it on a pool swim or something like that. It would take four hours to dry off. This thing is, you know, I wouldn't call it waterproof but it definitely sheds water at a much faster rate than any of the other bands. And it's much more comfortable for long periods of time. Unlike this guy, which Mm. although, although you are pretty sport band, uh, you are uncomfortable. Really? I don't, I mean, you mean because it kind of sticks to your arm and (sighs) yeah, yeah, it's a little bit. For me, I'm, I'm kind of in between sizes here, Mm. uh, especially on this rest because it doesn't actually fit uh, properly, but like, I'm between three and four normally here. And so if I do four, I don't know if you guys can see, but like my, I pinch my wrist. Oh, so okay. I start like, and then if I do it too loose, then the watch is too loose and I don't get uh, a good heart rate reading. So that was always a frustration for me. And I know uh, quite a few runners had that issue as well, where they wanted to run, they wanted to wear something that was going to, you know, be comfortable on their wrist, no matter what they were doing. Uh, but then they'd start to sweat or it just wouldn't, they'd be in between sizes and it wouldn't fit as snugly and get the heart rate monitoring that they needed for their workout. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, you you brought this up in your article about small watches that, uh, yes, big chunky watches are stylish, but the style is to wear them very, very loose. And yes. you can't do that with an Apple watch because then you won't get credit for walking, you know, down a flight of stairs. <laughs> and I, yeah, I you'll, need that. Yeah, you'll get the... Yeah, exactly. You'll you'll get the style, um, but it's basically a you know four hundred dollar uh, bracelet, mm-hmm. which I, I guess those those exist. You can get them from Louis Vuitton, but uh, you know maybe maybe just get the Louis bracelet instead of buying a buying a paperweight if you don't want the fitness tracking. Mm-hmm. And I uh, bought a fake. Uh, Hermes band, the double double tour, and it never stays connected. You know, I mean, uh, Georgia Dow has the the real Hermes double tour, and that stays. It's made, it's designed. That's what you're paying for, I guess. The twelve dollar one. Oh, without so much. much. Yeah, <laughs> it's a it's a little bit more expensive. Yeah, I actually I have a for what I what I called a faux maze. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have one of those double tours, and I have a real one as well. And as pretty as the faux maze looks, it definitely. I I agree with you. It has some has some downsides. Oh, you, you, all you iMore women have the, the double tour. (laughs) We did. Well, after, after the Apple, Apple watch launch, we all were, uh, we all got to pick out a band as a like, yay, this new thing launched. We're all going to, you know, get, get all of the the employees a a present for their hard work. And I think all of us were just like double tour. (laughs) Done. Of course. (laughs) That makes sense. Can't afford the watch. So we'll get the band. (laughs) Smart. Uh, all right. So eagle-eyed watchers of this show and of your videos on I'm More will notice that you wear your watch upside down. That's, or I call it wrong. You wear it wrong. 
<laughs> the, the, the digital crown is on the left side instead of the right side. Why do you do that? Well, I personally like this uh, upside down, quote unquote, uh, for a number of reasons, partially because uh, uh, when I'm playing roller derby, uh, as I said before, you have it's a full contact sport. So you need to wear wrist guards and the such. Um, the digital crown is actually in the absolute wrong place to wear wrist guards and bend your wrist back if you fall. Uh, cause normally it's on this side, right? In the normal orientation. So when I'd fall, I was constantly either taking screenshots by just pressing the thing over and over again, but also in watch OS three, uh, there's a nice new feature called auto pause workout where you can press both of the buttons at once and it'll auto pause your workout for you. So what was happening is I would wear my watch and then I'd fall during practice and it would auto pause the workout and it wouldn't start it again until I fell again. <laughs> So uh, I I finish after you know I finish a two three hour practice and only have 30 40 minutes of exercise recorded and I'm just kind of like what the like what's going on uh, and then I finally figured out I'm like oh it's it's auto pausing because I keep on pressing the buttons and spoiler what's worse is even if you lock the screen those auto that auto pause feature still works so uh, you know you can you can avoid unintended touches on your screen but you can't avoid unintended clicks. So that was one of the reasons where I'm like, okay, well, Apple offers this. Maybe I'll try it. Uh, but also Craig Hockenberry from the Icon Factory, uh, he wrote a piece way back in 2015 where he basically praised what he called reverse crown orientation uh, as ergonomically superior, especially for people who are wearing it on the left, uh, because instead of having to press your, uh, your index finger and kind of twisting the watch when you pressed on that side, if you press with your thumb, it's a little bit more comfortable and then you have the index finger to kind of balance it when you're pulling out to try and say hello to Siri uh, or to hit the side button and, you know, go look at the dock or scroll. Um, and I think, you know, I think he's absolutely right in that department. I find scrolling with my watch much, much easier with my thumb than trying to do it with my index finger uh, and to... I guess quell, quell the naysayers who are like, well, you're left-handed. Why are you wearing it on your left wrist? My right wrist, despite the fact that I am wearing a tester watch right here, this is extremely uncomfortable for me because I have a, a like a weird bone shape that just sticks here right into the watch. So from a from as a child, I've always worn my my watch on my left because it's ec extremely uncomfortable to wear it on the right for me. So yeah, maybe. Uh, Maybe it would be a comfortable orientation uh, for me on the opposing wrist, and maybe that would be fine in, in normal orientation. But I honestly, because I can't do that, reverse crown on the left wrist works really, really well for me. Uh, and also uh, the speaker and the microphone are on the opposite side here from this digital crown. So if I'm wearing a big puffy jacket uh, and say, especially this, I ran into this a lot in winter last year, where I would try and say, and I'm going to say ahoy telephone here so as not to set off a, a million <laughs> devices in the world. Um, if I was to say like, ahoy telephone, uh, what's the weather today? And I was already wearing a coat. If the microphone is facing inside towards my coat, it wouldn't hear me half of the time. Whereas you, if you flip it and now you have the mic facing outward, as long as your cuff, you know, you weren't like all the way up here, you had a dramatically better chance of Siri actually understanding you and saying, oh yeah, uh, here's the weather today. You definitely need another coat. You're definitely not warm enough. We don't have winter in California, so I don't know what you're talking about. <sighs> what are these coats you speak of? Winter. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you want to do this, you just go to the settings. I don't know if you can, can you see my watch okay, Kevin? Um, you can, no, there we go. Um, you just go, let's see, it's settings, right? Is there, there must be an easier way than looking through all of these things. Yeah, force, force press <laughs> What happened to you? For, ask Siri or force, where do, oh, force, what? force press on the watch face. Oh, on push, the watch face. Yes, push hard. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then you see where it says list view? Oh, yes. That's your new best friend. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. Um, and that then, is watch OS four. It's awesome. Okay. So then I see all my apps and settings must be here somewhere. Mm. Is it alphabetical? Oh, yeah. Okay. Alphabetical. alphabetical. <laughs> Thank you. PQ. Okay. 
settings. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so great. And then it's general. Yep. And orientation. And then, yeah. And then left. What the heck? And so I would turn it around like this. Do you change your mm -hmm. bands too? So they're easy. I do change my bands. Okay. Yeah. Because otherwise. It's a, it's a little bit. Okay. a little bit weirder to put it on that way. Yeah, I don't I don't even know if I can. <laughs> uh, you can okay. do it. I have faith. Okay, I'm going to yeah. try it and we will see uh if I like it. I like I like ergonomics. I think ergonomics is important. Um yeah. okay, well thank you for uh for explaining that and uh in our chat room web 1334 has made a good point. People w worry way too much what other people do. But thank you anyway, Serenity, for explaining that here and uh, in your video. So thank you. You got it. You know what? Any Anything I can do to give people a, a different option because it's it does it helps a lot of people. Some people like it, the original orientation, and that's fine. But uh, a lot of people I've heard from really, really like this, this orientation. So, and they didn't, they're like, I didn't even know that was a thing. So... <laughs> It's a thing. Drop in knowledge. <laughs> it's a thing. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about how you liked Siri uh, on the Series 3 Apple Watch. And I want to ask you about podcasts on the Apple Watch um, and Apple Watch with an Android phone. And bef but before that, uh, I want to thank our sponsor. But before we thank our sponsor, I also wanted to thank all of our studio guests who are here. We have 22, 22? Is that how many? 33. <laughs> 33 young ladies from Melbourne are here. They're uh, studying STEM and uh, they've traveled here. They've gone uh, to the Griffith, Griffith Observatory, which was difficult to say. <laughs> and uh, where else have you guys gone? Stanford, did you say? No. Caltech. Space Camp uh, in Atlanta, right? Uh, Huntsville, Huntsville uh, Alabama. <laughs> and uh, where else are you headed? Apple, Google. Apple, Google. So we're first, first stop, Twit, Apple, Google. <laughs> makes, makes sense. Thank you. Seems appropriate. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you guys for coming uh, to see the show. And uh, I also want to thank Rocket Mortgage, who is the sponsor of this show. If you have gotten a mortgage, hopefully you young ladies, you ninth and 10th graders from Melbourne haven't had to get a mortgage yet, but someday hopefully you will, because right now you can use technology, which you're familiar with, to help you find the right mortgage for you. It's easy to apply. And we thank Rocket Mortgage uh, for changing the mortgage experience. It wasn't keeping up with the times. It was dated. It needed a client-focused technological revolution. And that's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. They give you the confidence you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. It's simple, allows you to fully understand all the details and be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. It's also convenient. They have trusted partners and you can share your financial information with them with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button. And it's powerful whether you're looking to buy your first home or your 21st home, Rocket Mortgage is able to perform thousands of calculations in seconds Based on your income, assets, and credit, Rocket Mortgage can analyze all of the home loan options for which you qualify and find the one that's right for you. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply, understand fully, mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash iOS today. That's rocketmortgage.com slash iOS today. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states. NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. So Siri on the Apple Watch Series 3, what did you think? I think that when connected to the iPhone, it's a little bit faster than Series 2, but still about as reliable. Uh, when connected to the iPhone, you still occasionally will get the, especially if you're driving, the, uh, hold on one second, I'll tap you when I'm ready. Uh, maybe I'll give you a query. Maybe I'll just tell you that I'm unavailable. And that part I'm not super fond of, but um, I will say that Siri speaking is pretty darn cool. I thought that I was gonna hate it. I thought that I was just gonna turn it off forever because I don't usually like notifications on my watch or my phones or any of my electro electronic devices. But I'm actually really enjoying, especially given that the Series 3 has a little bit better of a microphone than the Series 2 or the Series 1. I'm enjoying just having my watch like sit by my side, flick the crown slightly to or flick the, the screen slightly to turn it on and just saying from from my position, you know, lying in a hammock or something saying, 
oh, hey, ahoy telephone. Uh, can you uh, can you check the weather for me or can you send a message to my friend Claudia? And it actually telling me, OK, what would you like to say to Claudia? Uh, and that's that's really nice because before I would, you know, I'd say the query and then I wouldn't know if Siri actually did it until it either tapped me on the wrist and it was like, no, I had no Internet connection or it would tap me a different way and say, OK, you know, here's all of this small, tiny text that I now have to read. Uh, having the having the voice is a is a great boon for accessibility, uh, whether or not you need tremendous like big time accessibility features or whether you're just, again, lying in a hammock and you don't really want to look at the screen because you're enjoying the last gasp of summer. <laughs> was that a train passing by just now? <laughs> I wish it was uh, the street cleaner. Oh, OK. <laughs> Montreal, very clean street. OK. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, we got an email from Frederick, who's an engineer at eBay, and he wants to know um, if you've found a way to listen to podcasts on your Apple Watch. So not streaming podcasts, not with your Series 3, but uh, with a Series 2, being able to transfer them to your watch and then like go running or go do a workout without your phone. Um, I know Overcast used to do this. And then they removed yeah. it uh, because it was too difficult. And Marco wrote a, a, po a post uh, about why, you know, why Apple needs to do something for, for it to make it easier. And he says many people weren't even really using that feature. Um, and, you know, when I looked this up, I found all the news articles from when he, you know, developed this feature, uh, which was being able to transfer your podcast to your Apple Watch. And then nothing about how he'd removed it. Like very few people noticed that he removed it at all. And he removed, it, he removed it partly before iOS 11 because iOS yeah. 11 changed things a little bit. Um, can you talk, do you, do you know, do you ever try to listen to podcasts uh, on your uh, non-LTE Apple Watch? Yeah, um, actually. So my fix unfortunately requires a Mac because the iPhone still doesn't allow you to add music files to the music app, which is a conversation for another day, uh, especially as the iPhone and iPad are becoming more autonomous. But uh, yeah, for now, the best way to do it is honestly to download podcast media as standalone files and then re-upload them to your personal music library and then build a playlist of those files. And then you can, you can sync those playlists to your Apple Watch and then listen from there. That is a pain. Like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sugarcoat that. That is a pain, and it really sucks. Uh, and I would like Apple to make a better way of doing this. Whether they just let you start syncing, you know, they add a podcast version of the app to the watch app, uh, or whether they provide better APIs for developers like Marco. I mean, the biggest, the biggest issue that he had with Overcast syncing is one of the ways that he used to sync progress, uh, playback progress between your phone and your your watch uh, was deprecated for iOS 11. So he basically was unable to use that feature for if he wanted to ship an iOS 11 app and overcast on iOS 11 and being iOS 11 ready is a little bit more important than overcast uh, having not perfect watch playback because again, it was already hacky to begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know there, there are some developers who are playing around with podcast syncing. Uh, right now you can use the audio APIs in the background if you're a workout app. Uh, so there are a couple of workout apps that are playing around with the idea of adding podcast sync uh, as, you know, workout while you listen to your favorite podcasts. Uh, and I know there are a couple other third-party apps that are that are doing that, like Peter Knapp's Watch Player is an interesting uh, option for that. I haven't tested it myself, uh, but I know that it is, a, it is something that some folks have used. Uh, it's really honestly about Apple improving tools. Uh, right now, it just doesn't seem like they care that much about podcast playing on the watch. And they're more focused about making sure that the music experience was really great before they moved over to podcasts, which is fair. Music's important on the watch. But uh, but now I'd like to see a little bit more leaning in the podcast direction. Yeah. I mean, I know a lot of people who work out when they listen to this. I listen to tons of podcasts when I work out, um, but I usually, I'm still bringing my phone with me. So I did download Watch Player and I tried to sync up some, uh, some podcasts and let's see. I, so this is the feed for the iMore podcast, the, the podcast that you guys oh, do boy. over there. <laughs> no, it's really pretty, isn't it? Um, and mm -hmm. it did work. It said it has some, yeah, so that, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't look pretty, but you have to be connected to, 
AirPods or AirPods any kind of Bluetooth. Or Bluetooth yeah. So yep. um, it says, please connect your Bluetooth phones to the Apple Watch to listen to your pod. So <laughs> uh, I <laughs> actually did the- that. Yeah, I did it and it did, it did work a little bit. And it lets you also use the, you know, your controls on your iPhone, um, which that's another uh, thing about Apple Watch 3 that you um, pointed out, or no, uh, Mac, yeah, uh, Watch OS, Watch OS 3. Yes, Watch OS 4. 4. Watch OS 4 uh, yeah. automatically connects to when your, when your phone connects to your car. And then I learned that from you. And it was, it's so amazing to be able to control I mean, not while you're driving, but maybe while you're at a stoplight. No. <laughs> yeah, no, I honestly, I like it also because you can, you know, drive and be like, you know, Ahoy Telephone, next song. <laughs> or, uh, or honestly, I find it even when you're holding the steering wheel, right? Going over and tapping this is a lot easier sometimes than even trying to fiddle on the steering wheel with all of the various commands um, or like scrolling up to change volume or scrolling down to change volume. Uh, it's just, it's, it's a much nicer experience, uh, not just, you know, for Bluetooth, Bluetooth speakers in your car, but Bluetooth speakers anywhere. You know, if you have a party speaker and you're rocking out in the house and you want to play DJ, you know, it used to be that you'd either have to run some special software or you'd have to go back every so often to your computer and, you know, fiddle some things, um, or even pull out your iPhone, uh, in, in sort of more recent years to change your playlists. Um, and now with your watch, you can literally, you know, queue up, say, say to Siri, you know, queue up this playlist or skip this song or turn the volume up or turn the volume down. Uh, and you basically have a little personal DJ on your wrist. It's pretty cool. Okay. So now you kind of hacked your way into using an Android phone with your <laughs> Apple watch. Tell us about that. I did. Okay, so uh, this came out of a hypothetical discussion late with drinks where I'm like, hmm, the LTE Apple Watch still requires an iPhone to set up. You still need an iPhone to set it up with cellular because it has to be on the same data plan as your iPhone's data plan. Um, And you still need the iPhone to sync fitness stuff. But I'm like, but in theory, the mechanics behind the way that the Apple Watch talks to the SIM on your iPhone and the way that it routes numbers through, uh, in theory, I wonder if you could swap the SIM after you activated it on an iPhone, if you could swap the SIM into an Android phone and continue getting calls and the like in an Android phone. And the answer is you can, uh, which I was really shocked by, honestly. Uh, I figured that Apple would have put in some, you know, some standby to stop this uh, or it just wouldn't work at all. Uh, but no, I was able to set up, oh, you know, this watch on my iPhone 8 Plus over AT&T. I signed it up for an AT&T, you know, additional 10, 10 bucks a month watch plan. And then I immediately took the SIM card out of my iPhone 8 Plus and I put it into an Android phone uh, and just let it rip. And it's interesting to note that when in this configuration, the watch doesn't share the Android phone's data connection, it just, it runs off LTE from the very start. So it's just like, I'm an LTE watch and the only connection it really has to that Android device is through phone calls. So if you call the Android phone, which in case is still my cell phone number, right? You call my cell phone number, it rings the Android phone, but because the watch was set up to use that cell phone number, it also rings the watch. So you can still get some notifications and some interactions from the Android phone on your watch. Uh, But that said, as I said, you need an iPhone to set everything up. Uh, So it's already going to rule out a lot of people who don't have that access to that. And ideally, you want an iPhone that you can access semi-regularly because you're going to want to sync fitness and the like. Uh, But also... You're losing out on quite a lot if you do it this way, right? You may get cell phone calls synced over, but because the watch is going to be on LTE all the time, you're going to see significant battery drain. Uh, As I said, when we were talking about battery life earlier, the watch is pretty great when it just relies on, you know, the iPhone's data connection or Wi-Fi networks. But the second that it starts to have to work for itself, it just takes a lot longer and it starts, you know, uh, after I think in the, the two hours that we were testing Android on an Apple watch or Apple watch, you know, running on an Android phone, the watch went down like 26%, uh, which is one of the biggest drops I've ever seen in battery life in such a short time from the watch since series zero. Uh, 
so that's that's kind of the the caveat where it's like this will work and for people who have both iphone and android uh like i think of uh you know your friend and mine andy anatko of course uh, a frequent uh guest of macbreak weekly uh, Andy, you know, carries uh, Android phones galore, but he also has uh, plenty of iPhone models. And I'm like, I'm thinking this might actually be a good solution for Andy because he loves his Apple Watch and he's, you know, so so on on Android Wear, uh, but he loves the Android phone system and the ecosystem. And I'm like, all right, Andy, well, here's your uh, here's your weird hacky uh, way to do it. <laughs> Just carry a charger wherever you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, actually. So uh, actually, there is a, there there is a company called Elevation Lab who created a product called Battery Pro, uh, and they came out with this a couple months before the Series Three came out. And I swear to God, I think they just knew in advance. They're like, "Yep, we believe these LTE rumors. It's going to come. It's going to happen." Um, and Battery Pro is a sim- essentially a battery charger. You know, an external an external battery like uh, like we see with most uh, you know most iPhone options. You know, you get their external battery and you've got a USB port. Uh, but in addition, it has a built in disc uh, to charge the Apple Watch, and it has a little Velcro strap that snaps over the top of the Apple Watch so that it doesn't move while you charge it. So if your Apple Watch is at like 5%, you can literally take the Apple Watch off, put it on this this charger, put the strap over it, and then throw it in your backpack and not have to worry about the charger becoming dislocated um, or the Apple Watch, you know, not charging because it's not, you know, at optimization. Uh, a lot of things that are just otherwise not very fun, <clears throat> excuse me, very fun to charge on the go. So it's, uh, I actually really, I love that battery case and I am, uh, I got it before the series three came out, but now I'm like, oh, well, I'm just, you know what? I'm just going to carry this around on the off chance that I need to make, you know, more than an hour of cell phone calls on my Apple watch. That looks nice. I have the Belkin, uh, valet charger, which mm-hmm. is sort of the same thing. I have it on my screen, Kevin, if you want to, um, show that it's a hundred dollars. And I do have that problem that you described that it falls off. Like, you know, I bring this yeah. on vacation with me and the, the, watch just falls right off of there. So the Velcro, that's smart. Yeah, that that was the thing that really got me is that I, I, there are a lot of portable watch chargers that are pretty good, including the valet. But this is the first one that's really like, no, this is not just meant to charge your Apple Watch on a night table, you know, on a nightstand while in between days. This is actually meant for heavy duty Apple Watch usage midday or like 45 degree uh, or 45, 45 hour double day plane trips, you know, crazy stuff. And it charges your iPhone too. So it's a nice little, nice little thing. That is smart. Okay. So uh, only a crazy person needs to uh, use an Android phone with an Apple watch. So crazy person or yep. Andy and or I don't know where the Venn diagram, <laughs> uh, the who, Venn diagram there. <laughs> yeah. who, uh, who needs the, the Apple watch with cellular? I know you said you were going to get it, but you know, both of us are very uh, ingrained in the Apple ecosystem. We love our Apple watches. So who do, who do you think would need this, who would you recommend it for? The Apple Watch with cellular, I think is, it's the it's the hint at what the Apple Watch is going to be in the coming years. This is where Apple wants to go, clearly. They want the device, possibly paired with the AirPods, to be a standalone device for you. You know, the, the iPhone is great as a camera, um, and it's becoming more and more uh, that kind of multimedia device. But I, I see Apple saying, okay, this is our first, you know, fork in the sand of this is where we want to go uh, with the product line. So I think anybody who is enough of an early adopter and interested to kind of experiment in that sandbox is definitely going to have a kick out of this. Honestly, I find that uh, that runners are probably going to be the people that I would suspect pick this up the most, especially I think about my dad, who's, you know, been a marathon runner his entire life. Uh, and routinely goes running in the mountains without a cell phone, you know, without without anything. And he'll be gone for, you know, seven, eight, nine hours. And my mother, you know, at, at this point, it's become a running joke where she's, you know, she bought my dad a, a bracelet last Christmas that just said his his name and his date of birth and like who to call in an emergency if he's found at the bottom of a mountain somewhere. Uh, and now the the Apple Watch kind of has that functionality built in between the SOS and also you know he can he can keep it in airplane mode, run up to a mountain, uh, and then call my mother from the top of the mountain and be like, hey, it took me you know two hours, so it'll probably take me another four, and you know I'll probably be two hours late for dinner. Whereas before it was just, 
oh yeah i, I came back 10 hours later i, I saw a deer i got distracted <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm ragging on my dad a little bit i love you dad but uh <laughs> but it's but it's true it's uh i i can see people who either don't want to bring their watch because they're going you know they're going swimming or they're going in maybe not so great situations and they don't want to bring their phone um, where the watch would be a really, you know, more than adequate companion. Uh, the only real downside to just carrying a watch and not carrying the iPhone is that you miss out on the camera. So if you see a deer, you just kind of have to experience it with your eyes and let the moment pass. Which maybe we should all do that a little bit more. Maybe. <laughs> Well, newsflash, Scooter X in the chat room says uh, iOS 11.0.1 update uh, just came out. I don't know if you've already gone in. That might have just happened. I'm going to look right now. Okay. So while you're downloading that, I'm going to take a minute uh, to thank our sponsor of this show, Texture. Texture is like Netflix for magazine. It is one of my favorite apps. I love it. I like magazines, but I hate the mess of magazines piling up next to me all over the floor, uh, covering the coffee table. And I just feel a lot of guilt about not uh, having read the consumer reports that was given to me as a gift. And with Texture, you get rid of all that guilt. You get rid of all those piles. You can read as many magazines as you possibly can or as few. And you don't have to feel bad about it. Uh, I used Texture over the weekend. There was this piece I was uh, on, on my computer and there was a piece in the New Yorker that I really wanted to read. And then I hit that paywall and I thought, oh, do I want to subscribe to the New Yorker? No. When's the next time I'm going to read the New Yorker? Probably not in a while. And then I opened the Texture app and I could read the article. Uh, because I subscribe to Texture. You can also look up a certain topic. Say you wanna find out all the reviews of the Apple Watch, uh, or you wanna find out um, how to plan a vacation, or you want to uh, find out articles for your teenage daughter. You can do all that. You can have a family account, uh, so everybody can look at the magazines they wanna look at, and they don't have to look at the magazines that they don't wanna look at. Uh, texture is, I highly recommend it. And we really thank them for sponsoring our show. It's entirely digital. So it's environmentally friendly. Um, that's great too. Uh, and you can still consume all the best magazines and articles. Texture is one low flat fee each month. And for that, you get 200 magazines. You don't have to subscribe to a few magazines or a bunch. You can subscribe and you can read uh, the articles you want to read with daily recommendations, exclusive interactive features. They also have videos. Your paper magazine doesn't have videos. Texture is searchable. You can mark what you like, check out back issues, and view bonus video content. It's like having a newsstand right in your pocket. Texture was also selected as one of Apple's top 2016 iPad apps. So it's not just my favorite app, it's also Apple's favorite app. Right now, Texture is offering you, you, that's right, I'm talking to you, a 14 day free trial when you go to texture.com slash twit. Make sure to add twit at the end so that uh, they know that we sent you to them. That's 14 days to try Texture for free. When you go to texture.com slash twit, try it. If you don't have nothing to lose. And we thank Texture for their support of iOS today. All right, back to did you did you already download it? It's it's risky to download. It's downloading. It. <laughs> it's downloading. Did it tell you uh, what what it's gonna what it, what what it's gonna do for you? Did, Bug or, fixes and improvements. Oh, which is what I like to hear from a .01 update. <laughs> All right, uh, so yeah, that's good. Um, it, but I don't know if there's a watch update yet. Uh, Hopefully, I have to see. download it to find out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 1101 Apple security updates. Let's see. So iOS 11.01 .01 includes the security content of iOS 11. That's helpful, Apple. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So speaking of iOS 11 and the iPhones, I mentioned at the top of the show, I got my iPhone 8. Uh, I am not waiting for it. And you got your iPhone. Yours is the white one, huh? No, it's the, oh, the gold, gold, that's the gold one. I see. Yeah, I just, I'm trying to get it to focus properly. It's just this lovely light shade of, of like slightly rosy copper gold. It's maybe the, maybe the prettiest iPhone Apple has ever made. I might have I, to um, exchange mine. I was thinking about that when you <laughs> said uh, you were going to exchange your Apple Watch because I don't know how I feel about the space gray. Like I, I like space yeah. gray, but um. And I, I didn't, yeah, I liked my rose gold. So 
Is that so? That is that your your review unit or your actual iPhone? This is my review unit. Um, I'm waiting for the ten for my for my actual iPhone. And Although I will say, this is a darn good iPhone, um, <laughs> and I'm really part of me is regretting waiting for the ten because I love the the back of this so much. And if the back of it looked like like if if the front looked like the back and had that same kind of rosy glow, I could maybe even convince myself to hold out for like 10.2. Uh, but no, I'm, I'm getting the 10. So the front is white or the front is that same gold? The front pink? is white. The front is lame old normal white. Mm-hmm. And the back is this beautiful, you know, translucent, almost pearl gold. And it's just, it's such a disappointment. I'm like, the back looks like all new, beautiful iPhone. The front looks like an iPhone. Mm-hmm. It just It just looks like every other iPhone. <laughs> So I'm loving the new portrait mode. I have been taking lots of uh, photos with it um, and lots of, so you'll see lots of photos that look like sometimes I haven't perfected it yet. Sometimes they look like bad Photoshop um, where the, the, <laughs> the stage lighting where it turns, I, I don't think it's going to let me yet. So, you know, you, you yeah. know that it works when it sees a face and it's yellow. Um, this turns yellow. The, that and it doesn't see a face, thankfully, um, on there. But let me see if I can find some of the. This is the regular portrait mode I took of my dog. That's a little bit blurry. There's, ah, um, baby. And I took. I made him look very dramatic too. There, <laughs> kind of looks like bad Photoshop. <laughs> oh, but it's kind of fun. I feel like there's going to be a whole subgenre of of weird photoshops of this. Yeah, I. Think I almost so. want to. Wonder if I can share some of the portrait mode photos. Oh, good, yeah, because I took a picture with one of my sons with the snake around his neck. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) Talk about bad album covers. Yeah, it really does. Yeah, he, I know. And so, yeah, there's, there it is again, the sort of portrait mode, very dramatic dog. Um, I think this was the best I did, the portrait lighting, um, the stage lighting. Oh, that's cute. I like Um, that a lot. Okay. Do you have any you can show us that you've done? Yeah, I think, I think I do. We'll see if the, it'll, it'll load here. I've got a couple of, a creepy, couple of creepy dogs. I don't know if you can see that. (laughs) Look at that baby. Yeah. He's so happy. Um, What I really want to show you are the ones... Oh, this, this is a good one, actually. This is my friend Dave uh, <laughs> torturing torturing some little sad dogs. It's just that the shot on the chihuahua's face. Just, <laughs> That's good detail. He's so yeah. sad. <laughs> so sad. The tears in his eyes. Did he get um, any pizza? Let's pretend he, he got pizza. He did not get any pizza. There's a, there's a good like portrait stage, uh, stage lighting test. Taken at, at breakfast, but the eight, the edges uh, are the edges are still lacking a little bit, don't you think? Yeah, they're not. I mean, this is this feature is absolutely beta, and it shows. This is not something where they're like, "This is ready for production, mm-hmm. and everything's going to be great." There's stage lighting on this dog. <laughs> where it's, oh, that's good. Like a dog, yeah, dog coming out from the abyss. <laughs> it's not doing any favors um, for anyone who's scared of put pit bulls, though. Probably. No, I know <laughs> they're such they're such good they puppies. Are good, they are good dogs. Uh, they're such good dogs. Oh, here we go. Here's some of the here's some of the photos. This this one is great. This one I took with my Apple Watch. Oh. Um, the Apple Watch now uh, has always had a, a remote camera app where you can control the camera remotely from your watch. Uh, but now it ha- uh, it allows you not only to take regular pictures, but you can take portrait mode pictures. You can add the flash. You can turn off HDR. You can shoot in video or slow mo or or even time lapse. You can control. And just about the only thing you can't shoot on the watch is panoramas, uh, which probably makes sense because <laughs> you know <laughs> panoramas. Yeah, that's a good uh, point because you can't. That was my problem, as you saw. Only my dog will pose for pictures, so you know. I, but I can't take selfies. I thought I couldn't take selfies with portrait mode, but now with the yeah with the watch app on yeah on the it's camera so app good. So let's see. Uh, let's see if I can edit this of Renee because I'm okay. on Mac OS High Sierra. So I believe there's a way to change portrait lighting. Is that true? <laughs> this is this you is when we yeah. <laughs> you should be able to do it. Uh, so you're you can do it on the Mac. After. Yeah, I'm. I'm pretty sure you can change it in, in, uh, in High Sierra, but I might be wrong, and I'm okay with that. 
Uh, there are quite a few things, if you notice, uh, outside of portrait lighting that you can change, including selective color, which is fun. So if you're like, I only want that color to to go, you can actually change like how much gets colored or not, which is kind of crazy, or like changing certain brightnesses or shades, which is neat. Um, they've got, of course, definitions and curves, like all of these new tools that kind of came out in High Sierra to make the Photos app you know, that, that much better. And of course, you know, there's always these, always colors, always lights. Ooh, there we go. Oh, that's good. It's a nice, nice, uh, almost all color gone. Very, very French cinema. Oh, yes. Uh, so can you, so now with High Sierra, you can uh, turn your live photos into GIFs or GIFs. Yeah, GIFs. <laughs> RG forever. So, but they have to start as live photos, right? You can't. Um, yes, they just do have to start as live photos. Right, which makes sense. I don't Let's know. See how if we can find a find a good one here. Um, let's see. It takes brave souls like us to reveal our photo um, album. To the I world. know our ridiculous. <laughs> most of these are test photos. Here, here's a good one. Here's here's Michael Fisher and I being super weird. <laughs> Uh, let's see how we figure out how to turn this into a... Michael Fisher, Mr. Yes. Mobile. Mr. Mobile, the mobilist. Oh, man, this uh, this computer is a, a little bit unhappy with the idea of running a Skype conversation, <laughs> everything else. So here we've got on the bottom, we've got our live options. So this is live right here. Let's, uh, let's what happens if we bounce it? What, what is it going to do? Oh, <laughs> Uh, I don't know how to play it. That's the that's the next one. There we go. Oh, oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's just letting letting him know, letting everybody know that Mr. Mobile is watching. <laughs> yeah, he has a little face twitch in there. That's totally worth it. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> and then you can change it to long exposure, uh, which I believe. Ooh, that that's gonna peg it a little bit. Hoo So a long exposure calculates all the motion, and then it makes like this blur which is kind of crazy. And then loop will just loop the entire clip over again. And then it just adds that nice little fade in. <laughs> I honestly think I like the bounce be best. Mm -hmm. Those are kind of fun. But maybe we'll like change boomerang. it back. Yeah. I always, I've always loved boomerang. It's mm -hmm. fun. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's talk about real video for a minute. Yeah. Um, the iPhone 8 has many new video features that I don't really know how to use, but you do. Uh, tell us about those. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the iPhone 8 and 8 Plus uh, both now have 4K 60, which means you can shoot in 4K and you can shoot at 60 frames a second, which is double the 30 frames a second that the iPhone 7 could shoot in. Um, and, uh, and it's, uh, really, it just adds smoother motion. Um, it's designed it really, especially, uh, when you're doing anything high speed to pick up more frames. Um, and then of course there's also an ultra slow-mo version of 1080p, which now is at 240 frames per second and past versions of the iPhone had 240 frames per second video, uh, but it was only at 720 resolution and now they've bumped it up to 1080. Uh, that comes at a little bit of a cost, which is to say that you have to shoot in Apple's new H.265 open format that they've adopted with the 8 and the 8 Plus. You can still shoot in the other formats in H.264, which is the older video codec. Uh, but if you want to shoot the really uh, storage expensive versions, uh, which is to say that uh, 4K video at 60 frames per second is going to gobble your storage if you were to shoot it at H.264, uh, H.265 stores it at about 40% better, uh, you know, uh, capacity. So it's uh, instead of saying a uh, five gigabyte file, you're more likely to have like a 2.7 gigabyte file when shooting, you know, two or three minutes of 4K video. So it, it saves your, your storage on your phone. Um, and it's nice for all video types. But if you're going to shoot in 4K60 or if you're going to shoot in 1080p, it's 240, you have to shoot in HEBC or H.265. The latter one, I think, is the better acronym. H.265 sounds much nicer than HEVIC. <laughs> yeah. So the the big news, the huge news with uh, High Sierra is uh, on the desktop and on your iPhone, now Siri uses Google instead of Bing. So Siri was sort ah. of, so th this is new, um, but Siri was kind of using Google already in some 
parts. But so this is basically for um, just consistency. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, um, I think that it makes sense from a perspective of Google's already paying Apple a lot of money uh, to be the default search provider on things like Safari. Uh, Bing was Apple's default search provider on Siri specifically for images um, and web searches in part because uh, I think that happened, that deal happened the same year that Google launched Assistant. So there may have been some butting heads uh, at, at will there. Uh, but ultimately, I think it just comes down to common sense where if Google is going to be the primary if Google is going to be the primary force um, and source of information on, you know, in Safari and most other areas, kind of makes sense to to have it also be primary and a, a main source of information uh, in Siri. So, okay, there there were not many launch day lines. There, I don't I don't know that there have been that many launch day lines in the last iPhone, but they were harder to get. But this is the first time that that Apple has released two high-end phones within a couple months of each other. Uh, what do you make? Do you think, I mean, we, I've seen the articles like, this is the end of Apple, this is the beginning of the end of Apple, um, just because people there isn't that much interest in the iPhone 8. What do you think about this? I honestly don't think that this is as big of a story as some people make it, in part because Apple makes it so easy to download or download. It's so easy to pre-order the iPhone 8 and 8 Plus uh, ahead of time. You know, the launch day lines made a lot of sense when it was almost impossible to get an iPhone, you know, in the first few hours of production. Instead, uh, they would be like, oh, it's going to be a four or five, six week wait and you can't reserve it in store. And now Apple's done a lot more to be like, yeah, we'll reserve a certain percentage of in store purchases for these, you know, for people who order in advance and all of that. Uh, so I think all of like I think all of those changes have been very beneficial for Apple in terms of customer satisfaction, but maybe not so great for uh, publications who are like lines. We miss the launch day lines. <laughs> Uh, and it does it does add a little bit of character to Apple, right? It does add um, it it gives uh, the iPhone a little bit more appeal to it. Oh, people are waiting in lines for this thing. What does that mean? Uh, but when it comes down to it, frankly, uh, the lines we're going to see lines for iPhone 10. We're not going to see lines for eight and eight plus. Eight and eight. It doesn't mean that eight and eight plus aren't fantastic phones because they are. I mean, if they were the only phones released, if the 10 didn't exist, we would be talking night and day about how good the improved camera is and what they've done in terms of the A11 Bionic processor, which is astounding, which just smokes every other phone on the market, which is kind of crazy, especially when we you know, talk about AR and everything that Apple's investing in there. Um, so the, the fact that they rebuilt the chassis and they have that lovely glass back and there's wireless charging, these are really great phones but they're not the phones that the nerds are getting excited about. They're not the phones, you know, I I wasn't really super excited about the 8 and the 8 Plus until I dug into them and I realized just how much Apple had put into these phones because it's like, okay, it's it's another iPhone. It's, uh, it's the next generation of iPhone. It's a better, it's probably the best iPhone that Apple's ever made. Uh, but all eyes are like, hello, iPhone 10. You might be super expensive and out of most of our price ranges, but we're still going to covet and wait in line for you and, you know, maybe not mortgage your house, but uh, maybe, you know, uh, take a balance out on your credit card to uh, to get the new and shiny. So I don't, I don't think that means that Apple's in trouble. I don't think that it means that the iPhone 8 and 8 Plus aren't going to sell in droves. It's just not the phone where you see the diehards line up uh, because it's, it's not it, it's not for them. It's for the rest of the world who really likes great iPhones. Mm -hmm. So wireless charging. I noticed your yeah. iPhone 8 was charged the old fashioned way through the lightning cable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you been using wireless charging? I have been using wireless charging. Um, I was actually using this in part because I was uploading some footage off of my iPhone mm -hmm. uh, because I wanted to, I'm in the middle of editing. We were talking about that Android, using Android with an Apple Watch. I'm in the middle of editing a little short video about that. Uh, and it's a little bit faster to transfer this way. But yeah, I, uh, I have a wireless charging pad set up right by my bed. Uh, I drop it down every night before I go to sleep. I'm really excited because it charges through my big bulky case here. Uh, it's not actually that big and bulky. It's 12 Souths Journal. It's the best wallet case that I have ever found because it hinges like that. Mm. So, and it 
you can make it into a little stand, which means you can take time lapse photos really easily. Um, it's a but it's a pretty thick case in terms of leather. Um, so being able to just plop it down and see the little light go ding and know, okay, wireless charging is enabled. That that makes me feel good. Uh, and also, I guess I should make a really quick side note. Please do not use a case on your iPhone 8 if it's a wallet case and the cards are underneath next to the wireless charging uh, mechanics. Because what happens when you place magnetic cards in between a magnetic surface and magnetic charging is that all of these cards are going to get nullified. <laughs> so don't, don't do that. Uh, make sure if you're going to get a, a wallet case for your iPhone and you're going to charge it with the case on that the cards are on top of the iPhone because you don't want all of your cards to get demagnetized. It would be very sad. Uh, but no, I, uh, I, I like wireless charging so far. I think the big um, the big knock that I have against it, honestly, okay, two knocks. The first knock that I have against it is that it's still kind of finicky about where you have to place the phone, whether or not it's in a case, it just, it really has to be kind of centered around the wireless charging pad. And thankfully the Belkin model that I have has that little green status light when it connects and makes uh, and gets wireless charging activated. So I know before I go to bed, oh, okay, my, my phone is connected. Like I don't have to worry about waking up and still seeing it at 10% battery life and being like, what did I do? Uh, and then the other thing I have against it, and this is this might be something that Apple's trying to change uh, with its upcoming air power standard, which is a build on of the QI charging or the key chi, chi charging standard. Uh, is that having to have it physically in contact with the pad is kind of frustrating, especially co considering that so many of us use our iPhones, you know, before we're going to bed, we want to maybe read a little bit. Uh, the fact that it has to be, you know, right next to the pad in order to have efficiency and charging is, uh, it can be frustrating. So it, I, I'm really interested to see what Apple does there in terms of not only having something on the pad and having it just kind of being able to lie there and not worry about, you know, having to put it just so, um, or whether they'll even allow wireless charging to happen off a pad and just in a an area. Then you start wirelessly charging your brain. You don't want that. Ugh. Yeah, I know. Then then 20 years later, it's like, we all have cancer. No. <laughs> um, so I have another uh, don't do that a recommendation. So I have a... a uh, a stand for my uh, phone in the car, um, not mm. a stand, but you know, and, and it uses this, it's a Kino stand and I love it. And it just oh, uses this magnet, magnetic. this, this great magnet. Um, Cause I put my phone in the case and it magnets right to the, you know, it sticks right there. Um, mm -hmm. And then, uh, so my wireless charging pad doesn't work through my case. Because it has a magnet. Because you have the magnet there, <laughs> yeah. Mm. and yeah, so this is the um, the Mophie wireless uh, charging pad, and it works great when I take the case off. And um, but then you know I have a, a problems because I can't uh, I can't charge it, and I also have this this okay. So this is the the Mophie was sixty dollars, and I found it really easy. Like that was what I was worried about too that it wouldn't you know it wouldn't I wouldn't know when it was charging, but I haven't had any trouble with that not charging at all. And, but thank you to, um, to iMore for recommending the Senio uh, stand, which I have right here. You can take a look at that too. Let's see if I can move it, move it over. And that also doesn't work with the magnet, but I just place it there and it charges and it, it doesn't have to be necessarily placed in the right place. And it has the, the light to say that it's, charging or not charging. Yeah. <laughs> and this one- I say I like that a lot. I like the light. <laughs> yeah, I do like the light too. And this one doesn't have the light. You say the Belkin has the light. Um, this the Belkin one, has a very tiny one, yep. This one is regularly $19, but um, you guys put a code uh, and I, I used the code and then it was $12, $13 yeah. for the thanks, Senio charger. Thanks to our friends at Thrifter. They're <laughs> great. <laughs> so yeah, I think hopefully that code still works because you do not need to pay $60 for that. Um, and then, because if you're reading, then you can use this as a stand too. Exactly. I, you know, I think I might pick a, pick up one of those as well because it, it looks really nice. I like it. Um, but yeah, now I just have to figure out how to get this magnet off here off of my nice new leather <laughs> case. Um, you need sorry. some gooby gone. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I do have goo gone. Yeah. That's a good idea. Um, cause probably if I put the magnet down there, it would work anyway. I've yeah. That's a, that's a good question. Maybe we should do a test on that on iMore. Like how, where can you position a, a magnet for your, you know, your car system that doesn't interfere with your wireless charger? Yeah. The answer I may be nowhere, unfortunately, <laughs> but we'll see. 
Because we'll I do it. love this Make car. It. Yeah. I do yeah. love the Kinu car mount. Um, mount. Okay, I've got one more final teenager tip, which came from my teenager, and probably all the teenagers here already know this. So you know you can screen record now with iOS on your iPad or your iPhone. Um, pretty easy. You can add it to your uh, notification center. It's this little button here. I can automatically record my screen to do demos, or um, also I could record the screen if someone sent a Snapchat that I wanted to record. And if you use Snapchat, oh. you you know that whenever you take a screenshot of someone's snap, that person gets a notification that says a screenshot was taken, um, or which basically means you're creepy. Why did you just take a screenshot of that image I sent you that I wanted to disappear? <laughs> uh, my daughter informed me that as iOS 11 updated and made screen recording possible, Snapchat also updated. And so if you uh, sent, if someone screen records while they're using Snapchat, that person gets a notification that says they're screen Smart. Recording. So yes, um, still don't, don't Snapchat anything that uh, you wouldn't want your grandmother to see um, everybody. That's my mom tip. Because <laughs> you never know. Because yes, they, you get a warning, but they, they still already have. So They've already done it. Yes. All right. So we, Serenity, I'm going to give you a chance to get a hat if you don't already have one. Do you have a hat? Uh, I don't have a hat with me. I have a cat. Oh, okay. <laughs> Perfect. It's one letter. It's one letter off. Okay. All right. Do you figure out how to put the cat on your head? No, don't really do that. All right. Um, uh, make sure she's going to stay with us for our app cat, uh, app, yeah. app cat <laughs> segment. This is the app cat segment. App cat. App cat. Um, all right. She's well, a big old fluff ball and being very patient with you. Right I know you want to we'll just... stick around and see what happens with the cat uh, on Serenity's head. So um, that's why I want to take a minute while you're sticking around to thank our sponsor of this show, Jamf Now. Uh, Jamf, that's J-A-M-F Now, is a way to easily manage and protect your Apple devices at work. So if you have uh, Apple devices and you're working in the enterprise, you want them to be safe and protected. Jamf Now is an on-demand mobile device management or an MDM solution for Apple devices. So when you first start your business, it's pretty easy to keep track of your own computer and your phone. But then you start to grow, you start to buy more technology for all your employees, and you start to worry and get stress and anxiety, and you get hives because it's very hard to keep up uh, with everyone's Macs, everyone's iPhone, everyone's iPad. What are they doing? Figuring out how to secure a lost iPad can be tough, especially if you're remote. Jamf Now makes that and a lot more much easier. It makes management tasks like deploying Wi-Fi passwords, securing company data, and enforcing passcodes simple and affordable. So it, however small your business is, this is something that you can afford. You don't have to feel that anxiety. You don't have to get hives. With Jamf Now, you can easily set up devices with the exact settings, accounts, and applications needed to do your job. Remotely configure settings like Wi-Fi passwords and email account information. You can protect sensitive information and even lock or wipe a device. Jamf Now allows you to centrally deploy apps, view device details, and get a 360 degree view of your inventory. No IT expertise needed. Set up, manage, and protect your Apple devices in just minutes so you can focus on your business instead. Start securing your business now with Jamf Now. Visit jamf.com slash iOS today to create a free Jamf Now account and manage your first three devices for free. Add more for just $2 a month per device. That's jamf.com slash iOS today. And we thank Jamf Now for their support. All right. So now it's time for the app cat time. Uh, you wear a cat. cat. <laughs> I, I wish I had a cat, but I have a hat instead. So I have a cat. You, I have a hat. You have a cat. Uh, what is your favorite app of this week? Well, my app, um, which this cat also enjoys, uh, <laughs> because this cat is constantly looking out the window and being like, hmm, I wonder if I can eat that bird. No, he's uh, he's looking out and he's trying to see the stars because the stars are, are very cool. Uh, and even though, you know, I'm living in Montreal right now and the stars aren't always visible, uh, one of the apps that I've really used lately, especially with AR Kit, is uh, Sky Guide. Um, and I've loved Sky Guide for a long time, but now with Sky Guide AR, uh, it actually allows you to not only see what the, sc the stars are in the sky based on your compass orientation, but you can actually overlay them in the sky with AR. 
Um, and I did that uh, a couple times in both in New York and here. And it actually is intelligent. It knows when you turn on AR, it can sense the difference between basically straight sky and objects like trees and buildings, and you can adjust the sensitivity. So if you want it to keep it very low and very subtle, you can see just a very faint overlay of like, these are the constellations and they shine through the trees, which is pretty darn cool. Um, and then if you want to really go all out, you can use two fingers and scroll upwards and it'll show you the full AR experience. And basically just, it, it looks like you're in the app, uh, but it's, it's so well done. It's, for people who want to test out AR kit, uh, and it's available to anybody who has an A9 processor or later, so I believe that's the 6S, um, or any of the the iPads released in that year or later, including all of the stuff released this year. Uh, Sky Guide is one of the coolest apps to test in AR. I was I was completely like I, as I said I love this app to begin with, but I was blown away from what you can see in in real time. Okay, so I have so it Megan, up on my screen. Yeah. What, what so you I... want to tap the compass. Oh, All right, nice so you see on the left-hand side, there's that there's that uh, camera uh, down in sort of the middle left, yep. So Sky Guide's gonna use the camera and turn on AR, and now if you pick it up, um, it's gonna show you the horizon <laughs> with the uh, with your camera. And you can use two fingers to adjust just how, uh, just how much, or two, sorry, a two finger straight swipe down or swipe up. Oh. Yeah, I like that. But you have to have the compass back on. Oh. <laughs> Why did it turn the compass off? All right. See how uh, it says sky blending? So, so that is, it, it, I'm assuming that it knows, so it, it's taking my location information or... or Correct. Uh, it's taking your location information and it's also taking oh, the compass blending. information. Yeah. So if you turn it completely off while you're using this camera... You'll basically just see, you know, the the world around you. But then the second that you turn, uh, you turn on sky blending a little bit, you'll see it interacting. Let's see. I think I actually have a video uh, that I took in New York of it working, and we'll see if I can actually load it in here. But it was like the the app itself is really cool because you can find just about anything, uh, especially if you're really interested in seeing the sky and seeing the stars. Uh, but in particular, it's it's really, really impressive when it comes to, you know, looking at uh, how they interact in, in the real world. Uh, yeah, here we go. I totally, I have this video. Okay, let's see so your I'll video. So I'll share a, all right. So I've turned on the compass and then I press my, uh, my camera button in just a second. So this is in screen record, I'm assuming. Yep, this is in screen record, exactly. So AR on, and now you've seen, this is the window outside my room in, uh, and now I'm slightly turning up sky blending, and now it's showing me where those stars are in the sky. And you notice how it, it hides things behind the buildings. So it's actually showing me where all of those constellations are. You know, I'm, I'm, there's a little bit, a Taurus is a little bit hidden behind that building. Oh, that's awesome. Isn't that amazing? So this is Sky Guide. It's two ninety nine, right? Yep, two ninety nine. It's one of one of the best purchases you can possibly make if you are into looking at the stars or even want to just see a, a cool demo of AR in action. Well, my app cat is also an AR app. Uh, it's The Very Hungry Caterpillar, which was one of my favorite books when I was little in AR, which I think is uh, really interesting. A lot of the kids apps that are in AR, things growing out of places. Uh, so it, uh, AR is very difficult to, to show. I think I took a video too. So you, uh, your caterpillar will show up in the world. See, there's there's my, uh, the audience you can see out there. <gasps> There's my caterpillar. Oh, whoa. <laughs> and uh, you have to take care of him and make sure that he's safe. And it's also a learning app. Um, I like books, but I also think that um, we have to admit that kids, the kids these days, even uh, and especially the very little ones, are going to um, have want to enjoy screen. So this is a fun app to enjoy together, just pressing and figuring out. Um, you can press the question mark to get tips if you want. Um, but yeah, it's just your book. In your in the real world, which I think is a good combo of, uh, you know, screens and and life. I think this is probably the future 
uh, some combination of augmented reality. So for uh, for Aww. parents, <laughs> this is uh, and you it's a game that continues on, and you, know, you just have to keep your caterpillar safe. So. Serenity, thank you so much for, for, to you and your cat for spending this time with, <laughs> with us. Uh, I really appreciate it. So you are the managing editor at iMore um, yep. and people can find you at Saturn on Twitter. Is there anything else, any other place people can find you uh, or any other, any other place you want to point people to? Yeah, um, I just started doing a podcast on Relay FM with Stephen Hackett uh, called Query, where we provide simple answers to complex tech questions. Uh, and we've been getting a lot of really, really good questions uh, off the hashtag Ask Query on Twitter. Uh, we answer three uh, or no, I guess five reader questions every single episode, two big questions and three speed run questions. So if you have questions about iOS 11 or watch OS 4 or the Apple Watch or anything non-Apple, we answer all sorts of tech questions. Uh, last episode, we did a deep dive on iMessage. We went into why uh, iMessage encryption is so awesome and why it's uh, it's actually really impressive uh, what Apple is doing behind the scenes. So uh, there's a lot of lot of fun things. We've, we've, it's like car talk for tech, basically. We have a good time, talk a lot about tech, uh, make some jokes. I love it. All, awesome. All fun stuff. Uh, and definitely follow uh, Serenity on Instagram too. Is that at Saturn as well? It is, yep. At mm -hmm. Saturn for all of the things. <laughs> all of the things. Thank you so much uh, for joining us and uh, check out iMore, check out Query. I'm going to subscribe to that podcast right now. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks, Megan. <laughs> And thanks to our audience, our studio audience. You guys were so well behaved and uh, I am excited for the rest of the places for where you're, you guys are gonna be going. Thanks so much for coming. And thanks to you for watching us. iOS Today is uh, every Tuesday at 9 a.m. Pacific. Leo will be back next week to join me and we'll talk more about the iPhone. He will get his iPhone 8 and we'll compare notes on that. And I'm sure we'll see lots of pictures of his vacation. We would love for you to subscribe to the show, twit.tv slash iOS. Uh, if you, even if you watch live, which you can do at twit.tv slash live, we also want you to subscribe because you never know when you're going to miss a show and then, then you have it. And if you think anyone else will be interested in iOS, check out, uh, tell them to subscribe to us too. And you can find me on Twitter at Megan Maroney. I love to have your questions and we can answer them on the show. We'd love to see your face. So send a video, take a little video with your screen or a voice memo, and you can email that to me at megan at twit.tv. And we'll see you next week on iOS Today.